I'm Greg Prince and welcome to Gospel Tangents. In 1985, Mark Hoffman blew himself with his own pipe bomb. Shannon Flynn, a good friend of Mark Hoffman, describes what bystanders did to save Hoffman's life. It's a pretty interesting story. But that bomb didn't just severely injure Hoffman, it blew the lid off Mormon history. We'll talk about the salamander letter and the magical worldview and how that really changed things for the Mormon history. Check out our conversation. But before we get to that, I just want to mention one other thing. I've added a new subscribe button on our website at gospeltangents.com. Just press that yellow button, and if you'll subscribe for $10 a month, you'll be the first one to receive a PDF copy of each of our transcripts each month. If you want to pay $15, you'll be the first one to get a print copy from Amazon.com. I'll make sure you get it. We'd really appreciate it if you'd do that, and it would help us to build some more resources so we can actually put this and other documentaries together. That's the purpose of these podcasts, is I want to put some real history resources and documentaries together. So anyway, I'd appreciate your help. Now back to our conversation. Well, so how many interactions did you have with the police? Um, do you remember? Oh. I know, I, the reason why I'm asking is because I know that Kurt Bench, when I, when I talked to him uh, a few months ago, he said that, uh, that you, I think it was the day of the bombing, I think it was October 16th, the, day, the second day of bombings, I guess I should say, that you and Kurt went to the police station and said, hey, I think we know something, and that the two of you came out to your cars and were looking for bombs after <laughs> to see if there was a car bomb or something. And so, yes. and you said... I was driving a red Audi 5000 in those days, <laughs> and we had ridden up there together and going back, and we did look. Wow. We did look because... It turns out Mark set off all those bombs, but of course we, we, we couldn't have believed that. So for us, it was there was still somebody somebody out there, and Mark's deception plan was working initially, but it only worked for well until he blew himself up, because Steve Christensen. Just one day, basically. Right? Yeah, Steve Christensen. That was the old. Uh, I've forgotten the name of the the, the judge building. Well, he was at the judge building, but this all stemmed from his from his business dealings with Steve Christensen, and I'll think of the name of the business because he had been with Steve Christensen for uh, I don't know four or five years before then. CFS. CFS, exactly. Kathleen Sheets. Oh, it's CFS. But then that night, there was a report about someone being seen in the judge building early in the morning, and he had on this leather jacket that was gray and green and well that didn't really fit so then the next day now mark's blown up well well and i'll tell you kurt wasn't able to tell this but i'll tell you the whole story here um the focus shifted to mark within an hour of that bomb going off in his car and this is the way that it happened um uh, since those bombs had gone off, the ATF had been called in because that's kind of their their area of expertise. And uh, that the car was sitting there on the hill behind the Deseret Gym. Uh, it had been on fire, not completely, but and of course it was still kind of smoking a little bit and dripping and whatever. And when when Mark had been blown up, he was laying in the street and. I'll, I'll give another little strange. This whole thing is just too weird. Uh, there were some people in the area that saw that happen, so several of them run over to him. There was a fellow by the last name of Christensen who saw that, went over, and his shirt, Mark's shirt, was torn a bit, and he could see garments. So he said, oh, that guy's a, he knew the guy was a member. Pulled out a little vial of oil, and gave him a blessing that he would live. Well, he did live. I'll let you all think about that one. <laughs> um, he had enough presence of mind that by the time the ambulance gets there, they're questioning him. They said, what happened? And he had regained enough, like I say, presence of mind after having just suffered this explosion uh, to say, a car hit me. A tan van came, was coming down the road, and the car hit me. That doesn't make any sense. Well, 
the ambulance people and the initial police said, you know, oh, well, so obviously he's, you know, he's traumatized, and, but he's concocted a story that doesn't fit. BATF comes, asks the police, who was it? It was this person. Where did you find him? Right here. What was the position? Da, 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 da. And then said, um, uh, uh, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. He told that van story later. What he told uh, the police was there was, uh, there was a bomb in the car, and he said it was over on the, the passenger seat or something. Well, they told the BATF guy that. He looked at that bomb damage, and he said, that's the bomber right there, because he knew instantly that his story and the evidence did not match. That's all they had to go on. But it, that turned the focus that quickly. From that point, they exercised faith in the classy Hebrews definition. They looked for evidence of things hoped for, assurances of things not seen. And so then he was taken to LDS Hospital, put in under a false name, and spent... You know, I, I don't know, a week or two weeks or something. Now, why was he put it in his false name? Anybody that comes into those hospital systems that are of a notorious nature, whether it's by crime or they're famous or something, are put under a false name. Was was he famous then? I mean, uh, in the Mormon community. Big, yeah. big crime. But it was just a big crime. Big okay. crime. Okay, so that's why they did that. Well, they, they assume, the hospital takes for an assumed that he was not the perpetrator but a victim. And so they don't want to give the perpetrator another chance to finish the job. Oh, I see. That makes sense. <laughs> it's crazy. But uh, somewhere, um, I'll have to find it. I, I have his, his wristband and the, oh. and the name. Now, that's something that you brought up a little bit before we started recording. So you have like a treasure trove of, of documents. Used to. I have a lot of copies, but I ended up selling most of that. But he had received a ton of stuff the first two years that he was in prison correspondence, and he kept all of it, and it was so much it couldn't be left there. So he asked his wife to take it all home. Oh, three or four years later, I was at her house. She wanted to get rid of it, throw it away, and I said, I'll take it. So I picked up like four garbage sacks of, of, so papers, papers, letters, the suit that he wore, to to the court. He, he got into prison the day he went in. Wow. And his his wrist bracelet from the hospital. What what are some other things that you've got in that collection? Or he, well, and I, I, if you took a picture, if not, you will. But the the when he when he was released from his mission. Mission president gave him his little picture card that went up on the board, shows everywhere he served, shows his tech, temple recommend that was signed by the mission president for him to go home with. Um, that, that was, I mean, that was just, that, that collecting spirit is strong. And so he, and, and all of the letters that he would answer, he has no photocopy there, obviously, so he would rewrite his response to any letter that he, he sent back, that he sent to anybody. So he would handwrite a copy of his own letters? That's correct. Wow. Because he wanted to have it. Why wouldn't he just copy that? Has no access to a copy machine. And he had seen that for f 10 years before. Because that's what people used to do in the days of Abraham Lincoln. That they would copy their own course. Copy their own letters. Because I know in the book, Salamander, um, it said that he, um, a lot, with a lot of his forgeries, he would show people photocopies. So, I mean, I, I've wondered, so would, would he like do some, some fake forgeries on regular paper? Because it would take, I would think it would take some practice to get, you know, Thomas Bullock's handwriting or Joseph Smith's handwriting or, or whoever. Would he just make copies of that so then they, Say, well, this is, this is the copy, and then I'll get you the real thing later? Another one of the reasons it took everybody so long to, to really latch on to this, because, again, another thing that's been very misreported, he had this room studio in the basement of his house that was his forgery central. The police searched that and found no forgeries. 
there was papers, there were notes and stuff, no forgeries. And again, no one believed that these forgeries could be pulled off without some tries. They, they fully expected to find the salamander letter half done and three quarters done and, and a quarter done where he's trying, you know, and then it doesn't work and he crumples it up and tries again, crumples it up, you know, that sort of a thing. He pulled off that salamander letter in one try. Wow. One try. That is the only exemplar. Did that in one go, front and back. So he, is that how he did most of his forgeries, just one try? One try. And then he, so, because he would make copies of these things and say, hey, I can get access to this, I need this money so I can go buy it or whatever, when he had it the whole time, right? I mean, isn't that what happened? Well, no, he would just produce to demand. Because someone would say, gosh, wouldn't it be cool if he could find something? I would love to find something someday from Betsy Ross. You, you never see anything about Betsy Ross, do you? And that may be true, you know, it rarely comes up, you know, and, 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 and she's not important in, in the documentary history of the United States. There was nothing, she wasn't part of the revolution or war or a general or, you know, anything like that. She's just very famous from the flag. So that would be a really nice thing to have that's not commonly around. Well, he would sit and go, yeah, yeah. And he'd listen to everything he said. And then six months later, guess what I just found? Wow! I, I wish I could find that. If you notice, everything he did was always to a demand or a point. Now, he did forge cut signatures and things like that, just as simple money-generating devices. But the Anthem transcript, man, that's big. <laughs> You know, that's to a demand. We know of its existence. Martin Harris has talked about it. There were some evidence that there was a part of a copy made, but the actual piece of paper, there it is. Joseph Smith, the third blessing, same way. Oh, there's, there's, there's council meeting notes about his son being ordained, and years later somebody said something about it. But where's the actual piece of paper? Boom. There it is. And most of his Americana was done to demand also, or to a point. In other words, you know, he, he, especially where he was going to make some money, it, w it wasn't George Washington saying, you know, I had a lovely day and had a piece of pork for lunch, the end. I mean, you know, it's George Washington handwriting, and that's, and that's nice. But... I hate Thomas Jefferson, and I wish, you know, somebody would shoot him. Whoa. So he always produced things that would, that would generate a lot of money, but they were always believable. He knew Kenneth Rendell real well. Mm, who's Kenneth Rendell? Kenneth Rendell is famous, I mean, in the book collecting world, because from, he was the person who discovered the Hitler diary forgeries but he did it from content. Um, the, the paper and the handwriting all could have worked, but as he examined that carefully, an entry in there, I was at Beertich Garden today and then yesterday and then flew to Berlin that night. Well, when you look at the dates, he looked and that, no, that can't work. It was wrong. The history of it was wrong. And so Mark was very well aware of that. So as an example, the, the salamander letter, people said, oh, that's going to ruin the church. And that completely goes against, you know, the standard history of the church. Well, it did go against the basic juvenile understanding that most members have of the church. But that particular concept, a salamander or toad, he actually took from Mormonism unveiled. And the concept of, of, be, of, of Joseph being prevented by that, he took it from a Jesse Knight diary. And so at the end of the day, it was new information, more, but down the same track. It would not, and in fact, it's been proved, I mean, it isn't a real letter, but I mean, my heavens, Michael Quinn some years later with Mormonism and the magic worldview, <laughs> he confirmed every bit of it. 
every bit of it. Not the particular animal and, you know, but confirmed every bit of it. Well, and I know that a lot of Hoffman forgeries uh, have, have ended up in scholarly books. Um, but when Actually we, not. Well, because I know it was Dean Jesse that had written something on... Uh, the Lucy Mac Smith letter, I've got that right here. That's true. Um, Richard Bushman used in a footnote a reference to one of Mark's forgeries, but very little outside of that. Well, and because well, I, I, it seems like Kurt Bench told me that they had to do, I don't know if retraction is the right word, but issue something with, with Dean Jesse's book that said, well, yeah, we, these, these documents that we were relying on are... Yeah, it was actually a journal article, but that one okay. had to be completely retracted. Okay, so, and I, and I know uh, in Quinn, one of Quinn's books, he talks about the Jonathan Dunham letter where Joseph Smith basically said, hey, you need to come rescue me from Carthage Jail. Exactly. So that one ended up in Quinn's book. That, that's a forgery that ended up in there. So what about this Mormonism and the magic world view? We're... Were some of the Hoffman forgeries in there? Or are you, no. You're, you're saying that... No, it's just because that book was written significantly after yeah, the fact. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, significantly after the fact. But the concepts were all borne out. So this idea of Joseph going on, on uh, and believing in magic and going on September 21st, the solstice. No, not the solstice, the equinox. Right. Equinox. Yeah. And, and he found out that, that, I mean, Mark in that letter, I mean, in that letter, you know, the Martin Harris letter, was just giving a little snippet of some magic belief. Well, now we know it's 100 times bigger than that. And so today, those, those letters, that Josiah Stoll letter about the money digging, of course we know he did that all the time. They would not be nearly as controversial, I mean, by a factor of 100 that they are now. Okay, so let me make sure I understand what you're saying. So we know that, jo that Joseph Smith did money digging, but it, it, it sounds like Hoffman came up with a letter saying that. Well, again, took referenced information and just kind of, again, just came up with a piece of paper. It was known for uh, forever that he had worked with Josiah Stoll. And, in fact, it was because of him working with Josiah Stoll that he was in the Harmony, Pennsylvania area, and that's how he met his future wife. Mm -hmm. and, and Joseph said that he, he, you know, tried to convince the old man that he was just wasting his time and money having us digging around trying to find this Spanish treasure. But there had never been the piece of paper where there's an actual contract. And, and I guess at the time, and, I, and again, this is just something to think about, you know, our understandings of church history um, hopefully are as bad now as they ever will be with the idea they're going to get better each day as time goes on. But that means 50 years ago they were significantly worse than what they are now. So, you know, in 1960, did most people believe that Joseph didn't do any of that money digging, didn't believe any of that magic stuff, didn't use a seer stone. Well, you can see how much things have changed. Not only does the church acknowledge that, they've printed a picture of the stone. And that says everything about, it says almost nothing about the artifacts, it tells us volumes about who we are, what we believe, how we think about things. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Shannon Flynn. Did you know that Shannon was arrested for being associated with Mark Hoffman? When I went down to be interviewed, I was just trying to be nice. I ended up going out in handcuffs. Um, my parents came down to the police station to pick up my car. And one of the detectives met them and said, oh, he murdered two people. You murdered two people? That's right. Really? I'll bet that went over well with your parents. Click here to subscribe, click here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some other videos that we've done here on YouTube. We hope you'll use this as a valuable resource to learn more about Mormon history.